the, what this amendment has done is to expand the, the state's policing powers and investigatory powers in a number of ways. And uh, it's also loosened a bit the definition of terrorist activity. The South African government is driving a number of pieces of legislation through parliament to deal with anti-money laundering issues and terrorism financing. This is to bring the country in line ostensibly with international norms. But there are concerns that this legislation goes too far and could cause additional problems. Joining me to discuss is advocate Carl Kemp. He is at the Pretoria Bar. Uh, Carl Kemp, welcome to the show. Uh, there are two pieces of legislation that we're dealing with specifically. Uh, could you provide us with some details and some of the potential risks? Yes, as you mentioned, two pieces of legislation, both bills seeking to amend pre-existing legislation. Uh, they both have come very explicitly in reaction to a mutual evaluation report that was uh, released in October of last year. That was so... Essentially, there's this global watchdog, the Financial Action Task Force, and that name has been around in the media for quite a while now, so most people should be familiar with it. And they kind of uh, regulate and monitor the various countries around the world's compliance with uh, financial best practice to prevent the financing of terrorism and money laundering and organized crime. So their report into South Africa was extremely critical. We are very much behind in terms of international best practice and uh, this led to uh, an increase in the type of report back South Africa has to do had to do over the past year and uh, we had a deadline of October this year the the consequence potentially being the gray listing of South Africa by the financial action task force at its next pl plenary meeting in February next year and that of course as has been quite conclusively documented in the media would have rather catastrophic effects in terms of bringing money into the country, investing in the country and doing business in the country. There's a big risk here uh, for the country as a whole. The, the executive had a year to try and address the deficiencies pointed out by the Financial Action Task Force. Um, and of course, we can't say this with any real certainty, but it would appear that uh, these two bills that have recently, and when I say recently, I mean in the past two months, uh, are kind of a belated reaction to that report. Um, so it's, it's reasonably multifaceted. Um, it's, it's, the response requires input and direction from all across cabinet um, with various departments. Uh, and it's obviously relates to extremely complex technical matters. You know, uh, financial regulation is extremely difficult to understand and, and, and really work and engage with in a meaningful way. All right, so Carl, uh, let's get a bit more specific. So we have two pieces of legislation. The first, which you have authored a submission on, on behalf of AfriForum, uh, is the Protection of Constitutional Democracy Against Terrorist and Related Activities Amendment Bill. Could we start with that one? We've had that since about 2005. Uh, it's never really been well received by uh, legal scholars. It's, uh, it, it generally suffers from all the problems that anti-terrorist legislation around the world has which is that very nebulous definition of terrorism you know and it it comes down to that cliche of one man's terrorist and is another man's freedom fighter so when are you actually engaged in uh political dissidence and when does that tip over into actual terrorist activity um so it it's always had its critics um and it's been used successfully to prosecute uh a few instances of terrorism over the years, but not frequently. Uh, I think most people will agree that we don't really have uh, a significant or substantial issue relating to domestic terrorism in South Africa. The, what this amendment has done is to expand the, the state's policing powers and investigatory powers in a number of ways. And uh, it's also loosened a bit the definition of terrorist activity. So that those two uh, those two amendments really together represent a risk to civil society actors and other advocacy groups for the same reasons that any expansion of state police power has um it's that you know it's open to abuse and in particular in this case could really represent a chilling effect on freedom of speech and the right to privacy 
Um, and that is because of the specifics, uh, which uh, to name one example, and perhaps the most prescient uh, would be that it's now an offense, or, or it will be an offense if the legislation is passed to uh, publish terrorism related materials. Um, what that could be is uh, difficult to say. The, the amendment uh, does try to define it in, in, to a certain extent, but it is irrevocably coupled to the definition of terrorist activity in the first place. So when you take an already loose and broad definition of terrorism and couple it to a loose definition of what would constitute publication, and uh, very specifically also in this instance, the, the act uh, criminalizes the encouragement of terrorism, which is something that across the world is seen as an absolute no-no in terms of this type of legislation, because encouraging something or encouraging a specific type of conduct is necessarily a very difficult <laughs> uh, and, and uh, uh, difficult way of a uh, form of intent or a form of uh, conduct to establish and establish and define. Um, so that's that's one example that uh, may pose a risk to civil society advocacy groups. Um, if we take relevant examples from South Africa's current uh, climate in terms of politics, Cape Exit, for example, Western Cape succession, secession from the rest of the country, um, or to use another uh, hot button political topic is the Israeli-Palestine debate, you know, um, so, so essentially the problem is that by adding this further offense related to terrorism activities, and because of what I mentioned with the definitions being so supple and loose, uh, it might make it more difficult for advocacy groups to fearlessly and freely comment on certain uh, difficult political matters, but particularly where it, has, uh, where it relates to the governance of South Africa generally, as in the example of the Cape exit. Um, there are other examples I could mention too, uh, for example, the fact that uh, the, the state would now be empowered to apply for uh, an order to court to decrypt certain devices, um, freezing orders on certain finances and, and, and bank accounts, for example, uh, would be uh, a bit more easier to come by purely because of the definitional problems experienced with defining terrorism. The problems in South Africa generally already to do with the legislatory framework. Um, it's all about the execution and the implementation. Um, in respect of the first act uh, or the first bill we discussed, you know, uh, the, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime recently released a report in which they spoke on condition on, of anonymity with several of the, uh, the staff members of, for example, the Hawks, uh, unit that deals with uh, crimes against the state, where they quite explicitly stated that uh, th the problem is not with what is criminalized, the problem is with the staffing of the unit and the resources allocated to investigating potential terrorist funding uh, or pot potential terrorist activity. And uh, I think much, would, much the same would be true of the uh, general amendment bill touching on the NPO regulation is that probably because there is uh, uh, an entire piece of legislation dedicated to the regulation of NPOs and civil society. Uh, the question is whether that is not already sufficient and that the execution of the state's mandate and the use of that legislation is not the bigger problem. Because at the moment, uh, the state might be able to get away with fulfilling the financial action task forces uh, recommendations by saying, look, we've put these two bills in place and they address these highlighted deficiencies. Um, that means nothing if the bodies and the groups like the police and the hawks and the courts um, tasked with fulfilling the objectives set by the legislature and the executive are unable to function or um, are simply under-resourced and understaffed to do so. Um, and that doesn't really solve our problem in terms of terrorist financing or money laundering, it simply allows the state to go avoid grey listing, for example, which is which would be fantastic, Miss, of course, but it's a bit like kicking the ball down the road, just waiting for the next crisis. Carl Kemp, thank you very much. Let's hand over to you, our audience. What do you think is behind some of this anti-terrorism and anti-money laundering legislative amendments? Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. Also, if you enjoy the analysis from the CRA, might be interested in becoming a client of the Center for Risk Analysis, 
There's a link in the description where you can find out more information. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.